Welcome everyone to our final session of this uh, health summit. I am pleased to introduce our closing, closing speaker, Senator Sidney Kamlager. Oh. <laughs> our Senator Sidney Kamlager, who represents the 30th Senate district covering Culver City, Ladera Heights, Westmont, and the Crenshaw downtown and Florence neighborhoods of Los Angeles. Like her predecessor in this seat, who I know many of you know, Holly Mitchell. Right. My screen just got taken over. <laughs> uh, she is a champion of children and families. Senator Conlogger has spent her career prioritizing equity and access for Californians and acting as a voice for the underserved. She recently authored legislation extending the CCS advisory group and requiring implicit bias training for healthcare professionals, law enforcement, and court employees. She's also helped raise the profile of issues affecting children with autism, individuals with developmental disabilities, maternal health, and mental health. She's here today to share her perspective about how to effectively advocate with the legislature and others and about her work on healthcare access and equity. Please welcome Senator Sydney Kahnlager. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for inviting me uh, to this conference. I'm sure most of us <clears throat> are tired of life in the virtual world, but I do have to say it is a great way to see folks and to get information um, while we are reclaiming um, better quality of life. And I know, especially for families and families who have <clears throat> children who are special needs or who are on the spectrum or families who are navigating the challenges of childcare, um, <clears throat> while it is sometimes stressful to have every single person under the same house under the same roof at the same time using the same internet, um, it actually can be stress relieving um, to know that you're able to take a pause from the computer or the virtual world to really manage um, or jump back into family life to help negotiate things. So there's some pluses and there's some minuses. And I just want to say thank you um, because this is a plus for me being able to share some words with you. My name is Sydney Kamlager. I'm the state senator for the 30th Senate District. Um, as you all know, I am a parent. Um, I have been a, a long time advocate for um, <clears throat> child care, accessible, high quality child care and also for the uh, developmental disability and special needs community. <clears throat> Can I, sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> when your hands touch your microphone, we're getting a little bit of- Oh, feedback. a little feedback, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm going to, here, you know, let's try. Now everyone in the house, including my pets, will be able to hear me. I was trying to save them. Uh, so as you all know, I am a parent, uh, a longtime advocate uh, for child care issues, high quality, accessible, affordable child care across all of our communities <clears throat> and in uh, various community settings, as well as a longtime advocate for our uh, special needs community and our developmental disability community. This actually started years ago when I was working at Crystal Stairs. I actually organized uh, Community Voices, which was um, uh, an extension of Parent Voices, but it included child care providers, license exempt, uh, center-based, and um, licensed providers, <clears throat> family child care homes, to also be part of this collection of voices uh, to talk to the state about making sure that we are protecting funding for our child care community. Uh, <clears throat> that led me to a number of regional centers that I am still honored to represent as the state senator for the 30th district um, and all of the challenges that our families face uh, that interact with <clears throat> regional centers um, and state bureaucracy when it comes to the DD community. So I am here and I'm here to stay and I will continue to uh, get in the mix when it comes um, to these kinds of issues. You know, last year, I have to say, uh, was a good year. It was a good year for child care and it was a good year um, for uh, the DD community. And partially that is because the state 
um, had a bountiful surplus, which allowed us to really make some very critical and deep investments into this space. But also because, believe it or not, we have begun to hear from more and more folks like you um, from these communities to help us understand how critical these issues are. On the one hand, you know, 2 million women left the workforce because of COVID and they left because they were having challenges negotiating employment or unemployment with the lack of childcare and managing the homework for their children. Many of those women have not returned back to the traditional workforce. <clears throat> that allowed us to really lean in with the governor to make sure that we were able to make some meaningful investments uh, into childcare to work a little bit more on upping reimbursement rates, to making sure that we were including thousands, hundreds of thousands more slots, um, and to figuring out ways to kind of <clears throat> weave together this uh, highly textured um, and very diverse fabric of, of childcare providers. We have more work to do, but thankfully we have a governor who has young children and a partner who makes sure that he understands how important family obligations are um, so that we, I, members of the Legislative Women's Caucus can continue to lean into this space. We also um, <clears throat> have begun to hear more from the developmental disability community. And I have to say, you know this, um, that is not a monolithic group. We heard this with regards to SB 639, Senator Marielena De Rosso's bill that really talked about equity in the workforce for um, adults that have um, special needs that want to be able to find employment uh, at a dignified wage. And if you listen to the floor statements, they were really diverse. Some folks talked about listening to people from their community who said, don't do this. And others like myself, shared stories that said why it was so important that we need to do this. I hope that you all find ways to stay unified on the issues that are most critical and then have honest discussions about where there is some divergence and why it is important to elevate those differences. At the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're pushing the needle that we're pushing the envelope forward to making sure we have budget priorities <clears throat> that include all of our values and see each of us and our family members, and that we have policies that are really uh, responsive. So I will also share, there was a bill that um, came through my uh, public safety committee that actually talked about spousal rape. And you would think it would not have anything to do with the developmental disability community. And yet, because of how that language was actually crafted, um, we had to have discussions that I don't know if the author was um, you know, mo aware of, or actually other members of the policy committee were aware of, um, how you, it's really important that you delineate um, different kinds of populations so that you can make sure that you're crafting policy um, that sees each population or each demographic in its entirety. Um, and when you are going to penalize someone or criminalize someone, I think it is incredibly important to hear from all communities. And I was grateful that the DD community actually stepped up during that hearing to talk about the differences and how um, consensual adults are seen and how they should per be perceived and the kinds of rights that they have and the kind of rights that would be taken as a result of that bill and ways to make accommodations to see them in their entirety. Uh, I think it's also important that we continue to be at the forefront of crafting legislation. It is one thing to come in the end when someone says, hello, will you sign on to this bill? Will you send a letter of support? It's it's another thing to actually be at the table and say, this is legislation that is important to us. It has come from our community. Um, I was really honored that the Children's Hospital actually came to me and said, 
hi, would you author AB 382 for us? You know, we need to make sure that this sunset is seen and extended because there's great work that's being done and, and we don't want that to end. That was never something that I would have even seen on my own or even known about. But having the community come to me and say, you know, can you help with this is really important. It's also great that that passed, I think, with unanimous support and was signed by the governor very early on. So kudos to all of you all for raising your voices and letting him know that he shouldn't sleep that. Uh, AB 1363 was another piece of legislation actually authored by my colleague, Assembly Member Luce Rivas, that really talks about you know, how we can identify and support K through 12 dual language learners at a very early age. And we know that in our state preschools and our systems across California, that isn't actually being done. SB 393 by another colleague of mine, Senator Melissa Hurtado, really um, <clears throat> seeks to improve access to child care um, for agricultural workers by aligning voucher-based child care programs. So two pieces of legislation that really focus on specific demographics and specific populations to make sure that their needs are being met and that um, their issues are being heard. Great examples, I hope, of ways that um, you can, this is my thing, it says 10 minutes is up, I've talked so fast, um, but these are examples of great ways that you all can step into this space and help to educate and empower legislators like myself to pick up your baton and to carry it across the finish line with sound, substantial, evidence-based legislation that is actually going to move the needle for you and your families. I just want to end <clears throat> by talking a little bit about AB 118, the Crisis Act. <clears throat> that was a bill of mine that got signed and into law this year, it ended up being a two-year bill, but the goal is to have community-based organizations get grants from the state to allow them to respond to 911 calls so that law enforcement doesn't have to. It got a lot of attention, obviously, because of the issues around um, <clears throat> policing, police violence, uh, the murder of George Floyd, um, Black Lives Matter. It gained a lot of traction in the developmental disability community because as you can imagine, and as you know, so many families have um, elevated their voices to share stories about how their brothers, their sisters, their kids, their fathers and mothers uh, <clears throat> and friends who are on the spectrum, who might have unregulated bodies, who might have um, you know, um, episodes, uh, when a family member or a friend reaches out for support and calls 911, how 911, how the responders come and really don't know how to address or de-escalate or resolve the crisis in front of them. And in many instances, it has resulted in folks being um, shot. A young man named Isaias Cervantes, autistic, deaf, um, and with scoliosis, actually was having an episode and was shot in the back in, uh, within eight seconds um, <clears throat> by a, a sheriff deputies. An example of how it is important for folks to understand the differences and the uniqueness of our child populations um, and to find ways to respond to crises and emergencies and issues in a way that is inclusive and safe. And so as a result of that incident and a couple of others, a number of disability organizations said, we want to be part of making sure that AB 118 passes because we want to be able to participate in how our community-based organizations who are trusted and have the credibility of the community are able to either step in and respond to some of these calls or to provide guidance on how they should be resolved so that we don't have these kinds of issues happen in the future. We need more of that. Um, I have a personal relationship uh, with a young person who was diagnosed with autism. And so this is something that's really near and dear to my heart, but not every legislator does. Um, and so it is your role to talk about the importance of childcare, of, of family centers, 
um, and of all of the young people that live across the spectrum and how we can create legislation um, <clears throat> that is responsive and reflective of their needs. So with that, I wanna thank you. And I certainly am available for any questions um, or to engage in some discussion. No, thank you, Senator, for those remarks. And if you have questions out there in the audience, please put them in the Q&A box or the chat or wherever, I will find them. <laughs> um, but I know you talked a lot about health, about <coughs> childcare, which is such a critical issue for families. I was just reading yesterday about the things that are in the Build Back Better Act and let's cross our fingers that that happens because it's gonna drastically increase access to childcare and help keep women in the workplace uh, if they want to be. Uh, so we did have one point of clarification on that front. Somebody was asking, is that 2 million women who left the workforce just in California? Um, or is that a national number? No, I believe that that was a national number. Um, and that was actually in the middle of COVID. So that yeah. number was, uh, <clears throat> it might have even grown, but that was given yeah. in 2020. Okay, excellent. And then kind of a request for uh, your advocacy going forward, uh, that there was a question in the conference community of child care for children with special health care needs. It's very difficult for care centers and providers to choose to serve children and youth with special health care needs and have the support to do so, and also to increase the opportunity for more providers with this focus. Can you help elevate this during implementation? I think that's something that, um... I and a couple of other legislators, you know, are focused on doing. I actually had a discussion with some a group yesterday, and we were talking about this very thing. It's one thing to come up with these very um, aspirational, robust bills, but it's one thing to get something signed. It is another thing to make sure that it is implemented in a way that fulfills the intention of the bill. And so we can say we want to do all sorts of things, but if we're actually not providing reimbursement rates um, at a level that will encourage all kinds of providers um, to get into this field and to do work and to be able to connect to um, patients and clients that we want them to be able to see, then what are we really doing? And so I have committed to doing this mostly because uh, with the maternal health, in the maternal health space, I'm really interested in making sure that we are um, having doulas and midwives um, enter into this and are able to do the work while being reimbursed um, at an appropriate um, rate by Medi-Cal. Just like I'm very <laughs> interested in making sure that street medicine teams who go out onto the streets and provide health care for folks who are unhoused are also able to get reimbursed for providing that care. Just like I'm equally interested in making sure that uh, young people who have special health care needs are able to find providers that are culturally responsive and sensitive who are able to provide health care for them that their families understand and can appreciate and can be re reimbursed um, at a, a rate that makes sense. So a very long yes to that answer. And in fact, I have a call with some folks from CalAIM later on today. And so I will make sure that I raise this with them. Lots of thank yous and happy dances in the audience from that one. <laughs> I was hoping before you go to just ask you, I know we have a lot of, we have some parents out there who um, are comfortable advocating and have really kind of stepped into that role on behalf of their children. But I know we have a lot more folks who find it fairly intimidating, right? And I think they worry about um, what will happen and what will people think of them if they if they come to speak to a legislator or to your staff. And so I was hoping maybe before you go, you could provide some encouragement and just the importance of that perspective to encourage more of them to, to get out there and, and speak and tell their own story. I will say, don't be afraid. Um, Legislators are people too. And believe it or not, we don't know everything. Another little secret, even though some of us like to pretend that we do, uh, we can also be intimidated by folks like you, real experts who have stories that um, are real and, and really can't be denied. And if you're telling your story to me, then chances are you're telling your story to another legislator. 
So if I get up and I poo poo you and I say, that isn't anything that makes sense, or I haven't even heard of that kind of issue before, chances are there's some other legislator who will get up and say, that's not true. I talked to this family. I talked to this parent and they told me this story and it is true and I believe them. So I say that to say, you have to have faith in the system and you have to believe in yourself and in your story. And at the end of the day, good policy comes from an exchange of ideas. So you can't be so selfish that you hold on to your ideas and your stories and you don't share them with legislators like me. Because when you do share them with me, then I can pick up the baton and I can change that story into policy or translate that story into policy. And that policy reflects you and your story. So if you're afraid or intimidated and you allow that to silence you, then where are you in this story that we call policy making? So you have the same power that I do. You have your story, your life experience, what you have seen in the field, what is working and what doesn't work. And that is incredibly powerful. So you grow power when you share power. So you have to share your story. Such a powerful reminder. Thank you very much, Sandra. And thank you for coming and taking the time with us today. And also just for your fierce advocacy on behalf of children and families and, and children and youth with special health care needs. I, we're very fortunate to have you in the legislature and look forward to working with you in the future on these important issues. Really appreciate you. Thank you so much. I appreciate all of you all. And you're right, Dina, that is a tweetable quote. Have faith in the system and believe in your story. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Senator. All right, thank you so much to Mira and to Senator Cam Lager. Um, I love that analogy of translating our stories into policy. It's a, a really great note to leave us with. Um, hi hey everyone, I am Ali Barclay. I'm the Family Engagement Manager at Family Voices of California. Um, and before we break into our networking lunchrooms, I would just like to take this time to thank everyone for attending our 19th Health, Health Summit. Um, it means a great deal to us that you've taken the valuable time out of your days to be with us these past two mornings. We hope this has been a time of learning new things, sharing, and feeling supported um, and meeting some new folks. So I, I also want to extend an enormous thank you to our generous sponsors, um, our wonderful speakers and session monitors, our amazing interpreters and everybody behind the scenes um, on our tech support crew. And of course, a huge thank you to our wonderful event planner, Holly Wong, who made our first online health summit a huge success. So thank you to everybody. Um, each session is recorded and will be available to watch on um, both the Whova platform and the Family Voices of California website soon. We'll send an email out to everybody with the link to those recordings and materials. Um, and now this is where we really need your help and input. Please take a couple of minutes this afternoon to complete our evaluation survey. Um, we'll be emailing it to you this afternoon. Um, your input is really valuable and a really critical piece of feedback for us. It helps um, shape our planning for, the, for our next um, Health Summit in 2022. Um, it was also just shared in the chat by Holly Wong. So you can take a look if you wanna fill that out right now before we send it out in the email. Um, and an optional networking lunch begins now. So you can click on the lunch session in the main agenda to go to a Zoom breakout with other attendees from your region. Lunch breakout room um, from your other region breakout room, which will be open for you until 1.15. So thank you so much to you all. Be well, have fun, um, and enjoy the rest of your week. And we'll see you at our next health summit.